千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Derek Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. I would like to invite you to center your thoughts and direct your attention to this moment in time, to the here and now, to be fully present and mindfully aware. As we all ready ourselves for this sacred process of the Tao, let's get right back to finish up Chapter Seventy One of the Tao Te Ching. And for those of you who have been following this meeting, I'm sure we, you recall that the meeting title in Chinese, Wu Bing Zhang. Translated as "without fault," and there's a specific meaning associated with this, as you recall from before. Where "being" often mistranslated in this context as illness is actually a problem, a flaw, or fault. So to not have it, to be without it, it just means that a sage has been looking out for. Discovering his or her own flaws in order to do something about it, and having improved himself or herself is now without fault. Having improved or removed the fault no longer has it. So the chapter itself, as we analyzed previously, was divided into three parts, and we were able to cover. The first two parts in the meeting before the last meeting. So in the last meeting, we were able to focus and concentrate on the last part. As you can see, the last part is basically just three lines from line five to line seven. Line five begins with "shen ren," which we translate as "the sages," and this bears. Reemphasizing, we used this slide last time to use to list historical examples of the people who were considered to be in that position, having that title, "shenren," sages, widely regarded as sages, and this included Lao Tzu, Zhuang Tzu, Kong Tzu, Meng Tzu. So the first two belong to the Tao school of thought, Tao philosophy, and the last two, the bottom two, belong to the Confucian philosophy school. And I say philosophy because these sages are as primarily associated with philosophy rather than religion. They were considered to be great teachers and philosophers, not priests, nor were they considered to be founders of religions. And this is another reason why we should never use the term "holy man" to translate "shenren." That's a misnomer. And in Eastern thought, the division. Between philosophy and religion has not traditionally been as cut and dry as we find in Western history and traditions. So there are actually temples devoted to Confucian teachings, to Confucius with a statue of Confucius. Someone who's not familiar with the culture will just look at that and assume that it's all religious trappings. But it's just a way to demonstrate veneration and respect, similar to what Westerners mistakenly call ancestor worship. It looks like it's going to be some sort of a religious tradition, but to 
the Asians themselves. It's simply a way to demonstrate veneration for ancestors, to remember all that the ancestors had done for us so that we can, we can live, so that we can exist. Same with Laozi and Zhuangzi. These are venerated, respected figures from history, and they can be seen purely in that way rather than in a religious context. They do not possess supernatural powers. They did not foretell prophecies. They were not seen in the same light as, in a similar light as Muhammad or the Buddha, religious teachers. They were philosophical teachers. Now, these sages all have one thing in common, and that is they were always looking at themselves in terms of self-review or self-examination. They were always very big on making sure that they understood themselves, that they could see themselves clearly, or you might say self-awareness. In the review of their own actions, their words with other people, there is a process that they go through. So last time I explained that process from the Zen Buddhism tradition, the Zen tradition resulted as a fusion of Buddhist teachings and Tao teachings. The Zen Buddhist tradition, known for meditation, has remarkable teachings spelling out the process of a self-review, which all the sages followed. And that is the reason why they could be without fault. They worked on themselves diligently. So we talked about this process, repentance and remorse, chan hui. And this is broken up into two parts. It's a review of the past and a resolution for the future. The repentance part, this is actually a specialized term from the Buddhist tradition. It's about looking in the past to recognize the faults, faults that might have come from you being ignorant, you being confused or arrogant or being envious. All of those negative emotions could have resulted in faults. Then the realization that this is what led to negative actions and words. And then the regrets about past actions or words that have caused problems for other people, caused harm or wronged other people. So that's about the past. And then Hui, remorse directed at the future, specifically uh, also uh, a Buddhist term. Specifically, it means to make a resolution to not let it happen again. And then not only that, but also the resolution to provide some kind of remedy, to remedy the wrong, to make it right, make amends. And then finally, a big part of it is the renewal of yourself to be a better person. So it will not be possible for you to do the same, for you to do the same thing again. All of this comes from the platform sutra of the sixth patriarch, Liu Zhu Tan Jing. In that same work, in that same sutra from the sixth patriarch, the, the Huinen, the sixth patriarch, went on to explain the process, how this is so important to repent, to be remorseful. It is important because it is working on yourself. And this is the term that he had, the deliverance of your self-nature, and multiple terms we talked about. This all expanded from the teachings of Huinen, the sixth patriarch. And what I call deliverance in the original language is to ferry either oneself or someone else in a boat. And this is because the teachings of the Buddha are compared to vessels like a boat that can carry you through the ocean of suffering. And 
those who are not on board such vessels are still trapped in the ocean, the ocean of bitterness, the ocean of suffering. Then Huinan talked about self-nature. That self-nature, what one might call the soul in the West, that is the elements, the singularity that will always be you, regardless of anything about you that changes. So it is also pointing to the unique individual consciousness that is you, and that is refined through infinite number of lifetimes, eternal incarnations through forever. And that self-nature, that which gets refined, is what enables self-deliverance or ferrying yourself. So Huinan emphasized that we all have the power to do that for ourselves, and only when you are able to do that do you have the ability to help other people. And finally, we ended with Du Ren. Du Ren is literally to ferry others, that is, to assist others, to help others onto the boat, which, remember, represents dharmic teachings, teachings from the Buddha, teachings of wisdom, and some additional terms that you see there, the ocean of bitterness, Ku Hai. That's the metaphor for the world itself, because there's so much suffering in the world, it's like the ocean of bitterness that extends indefinitely in all directions. So the vessel we have talked about, and then to climb aboard the vessel ourselves, zidu, that is to get yourself on board so you can ferry yourself. Then you gain the ability to help other people, du ren. And additional details are explained in the Tao of Tranquility. As I mentioned last time, the Tao of Tranquility is available as a Kindle ebook, as paperback, and also as audiobook. So this is the point at which we stopped last time. So the previous few slides were the recap to kind of bring everybody up to date on what we're at. So we just have one last thing to talk about in this overall process. A, another one of my graphs where I hoped to depict the overall process graphically so that you can see what it looks like with one glance. Oftentimes, people say that a picture is worth a thousand words. So I am hoping to do that with the deliverance of your self-nature, we start with human beings, and by this I mean all human beings, regardless of background, religion, ethnicity, geographical boundaries, national origin, all human beings, billions of us. So out of the massive amounts of human beings on this planet, the majority, most people, are still working through the process of even beginning to be enlightened. So most people I would describe as, as being in one of those two categories where Lao Tzu says to not know but think you know is flawed. Indeed, most people are flawed in that way. They're not intrinsically flawed but perhaps they've never encountered the vessel that will help them sail through the ocean of bitter suffering. So oftentimes, here's what we observe about people. When they encounter problems in life, they usually have excuses for themselves. And if you think about it, excuses for oneself, you and I are not immune to that. You and I also come up with plenty of excuses for ourselves if we're brutally honest and frank. So this is all about being unable 
having the inability to recognize a fault as a fault. We excuse ourselves from the fault. We may say things like, well, that's just the way I am. I am just the way I am. I'm not gonna change for anybody. Why bother changing? Now, that excuse and other excuses we invent for ourselves have an effect because when we don't change, we keep making the same mistakes, we keep encountering the same problems. So, graphically, this loops back to more excuses, which ends up being more repetition of the same cycle. We're trapped in that cycle, which is why in Buddhism and the Zen tradition, it is said that most people, most sentient beings are trapped in the ocean of bitterness, ku hai. And most people have a big problem breaking out of that vicious cycle. This is the role that spiritual teachings can play in helping people liberate themselves from that. That's the deliverance, salvation aspect of it. And that is what we have to emulate the sages we have to learn what the sages do and do the same thing. That's on the right-hand side. The few, the Tao cultivators and the sages, the description from Laozi is that to know that you do not know is highest. Because when you know that there are things you still do not know about yourself, it motivates you to find out what that is. It motivates you to recognize the fault as a fault. That's the line. Yi qi bing bing. So remember, the mistranslation that I explained last time is that oftentimes in the West, it gets mistranslated as recognizing uh, being sick, uh, sick of being sick. I am sick of being sick. The actual meaning of the line from Lao Tzu has nothing to do with being sick or being sick and tired of being sick. It is actually all about recognizing a problem as a problem, a fault as a fault, a flaw in one's personality as a flaw. Only when you recognize that can you do something about it. Then you can be without that particular fault or problem or flaw. Shi yi bu bing. Therefore, you can be without fault. And this is what leads to the Tao, rather than to be trapped in the ocean of bitterness. And this is the reasoning for the last part of this chapter of the Tao Te Ching. Shen ren bu bing, yi qi bing bing, shi yi bu bing. The sages are without fault because they recognize the fault as a fault. That is why they are without fault. So it seems like a repetition there from Lao Tzu, but as you can see in the graphical breakdown, it's actually representing reality as we have it today. It's actually a clear picture of why we do what we do, why most, most people are the way they are, and how our world is in its current shape. So now, having gone through this process graphically, I think we are ready for the paraphrase portion of Tao Te Ching chapter 71. Our purpose with the paraphrase, as ever, is to demonstrate our understanding by expressing the original in our own words with modern language. So here's what the chapter looks like. In the first section, we have these two lines, memorable lines, to know that you do not know is highest, to not know but think you know is flawed. Having seen that graph just now, you can see the division. All humanity is divided into two parts, but let's not make the mistake in thinking that it's 50-50. It isn't that half the humanity doesn't know what to do, 
and health does, we know from experience that most people are still trapped in the suffering of the material world. It is only the few, hopefully ourselves, that have the ability to make the effort to break out of that for personal spiritual liberation. Therefore, for the first two lines, I would like to offer the following. Those who follow the Tao realize they do not know everything. They learn more through the humility of this realization. Those who are contrary to the Tao are ignorant of their own ignorance, and this leads them to the flaw of arrogance. So here, what we're doing is that we're using words to depict the same thing that you saw in the graph. Then the second section follows like this. Those who recognize the problems as problems are the ones who can solve them. They are completely different from the ones who remain stubbornly unaware and therefore powerless to change anything for the better. When we say it like that, this truth seems so obvious. And yet, if it is so obvious, why is it that so many people, sometimes ourselves included, are still doing things, repeating mistakes, and being foolish without the lessons of history? We can all take a moment to realize that we wish to break away from the pack the path that is still trapped, so that we can seek our own path, a path that leads to liberation, spiritual liberation. And then the last part, the concluding part, is about the sages. This is what we want to emulate. The sages are without fault because they recognize the fault as a fault. That is, that is why they are without fault. We too want to be without fault, and therefore, we too want to recognize our own faults. Here's the paraphrase that I want to offer for that. This is how the sages work on themselves. They practice self-reflection by reviewing the words and actions on a regular basis. By noting their problems as problems, they gain leverage on themselves to work on solutions. We have to do the same in Tao cultivation recognize our imperfections in the present moment and use that recognition to perfect ourselves for a future of greater enlightenment. That is the paraphrase for the final section. And I think we are now ready for the one last part, the full circle analysis. So the last part, the very last line, that you see in the lower right-hand corner. In the last line, <clears throat> Lao Tzu is basically saying that the sages recognize their faults in order to eliminate them. And then the first line, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner, we can link back to that and see to know that you do not know is highest. And then full circle, linking it back down, we can see the meaning of the two lines is in fact connected. What it's saying is that, well, how do the sages become without fault? Well, they actively explore areas they do not know about themselves in order to uncover their shortcomings. So, they, in general, explore areas they do not know to increase their learning and mastery, but especially they want to know about what they are unaware of about themselves because they want greater self-awareness. Now, we too should become more self-aware. We shall learn from the example of the sages, actively review our daily lives, in order to refine our essence. So the question is, what do we still not know about ourselves? The question to ask will be things like, am I being arrogant or am I delusional in some ways without realizing it? 
Here's the bottom line. Fu wei bing bing, shi yi bu bing. Recognize our faults so we can be without them. This concludes our discussion of Tao Te Ching, Chapter 71. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us all travel safely so we can meet again. Until next time, may the Dell fill you with peace and happiness.